Here we go. The lady told us it's all happening. David Hitt is here. He's the author of a couple of fantastic books, Homesteading in Space, which I'm intrigued by, and uh, Bold Day Rise. The Space Shuttle Early Years, those were the best years, weren't they, David, or were they? In my mind, they were. You know, I was, I was still very young for those early years, and it was the, the time when it seemed like anything was possible. There was a lot that, uh, that was accomplished in the, the later part of the program, but that, uh, that initial golden age when, uh, when it bordered on science fiction was something to behold. I'm a little bit older than you, so, uh, but I was still as amazed as anyone, I think, ever on the news, they used to show uh, initially every um, return, and then yes. you'd see it coming in, and then you'd be like, oh, is it going to crash this time? <laughs> but then it didn't. And, um, you know, it, it was really exciting. But the first big space um, rocket and stuff experience I had is with, uh, you know, Skylab crashing in Austra- into Australia. Ah, yes. Um, yes. Of which I, res- I assume we um, got a check from the US government for the cleanup because it put stuff all over the continent. <laughs> so yes, we uh, we apologize for littering. There was there was actually a a fine. The uh, the Shire of Esperance fined NASA four hundred dollars for littering, oh, and yeah. uh, and that fine ended up going unpaid for decades until finally some radio DJ took it upon himself to uh, to make it right and paid Esperance for the uh, the the inconvenience that was uh, bestowed upon them with the uh, with the Skylab program reentry. But um, they said. It's, they said at some point as it passes over, I mean, you may be able to see it, and we weren't lucky enough. But in my 20s, I did see a satellite burn up on reentry, but I didn't know it was a satellite because I was being in my 20s and not watching the news. So I saw a huge big star, I mean, an, uh, you know, uh, an asteroid or a comet as far as we were concerned. Right. And we were very scared because that's, you know, seeing something 20 times uh, brighter than that. <laughs> sure, sure. So uh, we decided to chase it across the district. But, of course, it, it was going a lot faster than our car. And so, uh, and then we found out later that uh, what, it, what it was. So I guess the story doesn't have, a, um, doesn't have an extraterrestrial ending, but it was still a fun day. I don't know what you're uh, meant to do with that information, David. <laughs> something to behold, I expect. I've I've never been fortunate enough to see anything quite that uh, quite that exciting yeah. coming in. Of course, you know anybody now can. If you want to see the uh, the space station go over, or see the uh, I've even seen the Hubble Space Telescope on a uh, on a good night. Uh, you can find tracking apps, and you can go out and just watch them fly across the sky. And so I've done that yeah. several times. Me too. Back in the uh, the shuttle day, it was exciting because you could see the the space shuttle chasing the space station across the sky. You'd see uh, you know two dots. At one point, I saw uh, three different spaceships tracking each other across the sky, and that's uh, that's really Amazing. neat. When you get the multiple passes, yeah. So I'm an early riser, obviously, because I've risen early to speak to you, and. Um, and then I would go out in the backyard to start with the animals, you know, to feed the animals. And they were also early risers, by the way. And um, if it was a good night, I, I, I uh, just as the first few rays of the sun came over the globe, and then I, I'd catch quite a few satellites, not the space station, nothing, nothing in near Earth or what I didn't think, but just, just little bright dots. And I'd always uh, stop to watch them. And it was just amazing to think there's so many things up there floating around the, pl- the planet but um, I suppose if you squeezed them all into a big ball it wouldn't be that big a ball that's why they're not colliding into each other and smart people have sorted it out <laughs> there's yeah right now there's still a lot of space in between them but the more we launch the uh, the more of a potential issue it becomes so but like you say glad that uh, the people are way smarter than I are <laughs> responsible yeah. for making sure they're not colliding I don't know what their names are. George Clooney or something I've seen. He's been involved in some way. <laughs> but, um, you know, movies, uh, you know, they, they can uh, they can exaggerate a little, can't they? A little movies. bit, yes. A little bit. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, your early years. So you grew up 
in you know surrounded by space and rockets and then you just stayed there and carried on with it no i no? yes 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 to the first part no to the second right. i yes i grew up here in huntsville alabama in the rocket city driving past moon rockets on the uh you know on the way to the mall sort of thing you know in the shadow of nasa's marshall space flight center um, when I'm growing up here, oh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to MIT and I'm going to become an aerospace engineer and I'm going to come back to Huntsville and I'm going to work on big rockets. And that was my goal up until, say, maybe 10th grade or so um, when I decided, you know what, forget the rockets. I'm going to go into newspapers. I'm going to go into journalism and I never lost the passion, the excitement for space, but I liked doing the communications more than I liked yeah, <laughs> like sure. more than I liked my math classes. So, you know, I, I kind of felt like I had to choose, do I, do I do this space thing that I love or do I do this communications thing that I love doing? So I actually left here, went and, um, you know, moved, stayed away to go to college, ended up working at small town weekly newspapers for, uh, for about six years out of school before, Somebody pointed out to me, you know, you know, NASA needs writers too. So moved back to Huntsville, became a uh, contractor out at Marshall, eventually go on to uh, support, you know, the, uh, the, the rocket program. So ended up in the right place, but got there completely the wrong way. Oh, amazing. What do you think is the important thing about communication? Is it being good at it or just rambling on incoherently the way I do? <laughs> based on uh, based on this conversation, I think you're going to find we uh, we have a similar style. We uh, we value the same things <laughs> in this area. So you know that's a great thing about working in communications in a uh, in a technical field like uh, space flight. Is I'm surrounded by engineers for whom this is kind of arcane, right? Mm. You know, this is uh, these these are literal rocket scientists. They are you know literally mm. the most brilliant people on the planet. A lot of them are uncomfortable with communications. They're uncomfortable mm. with public speaking. They're uncomfortable with writing. And so, you know, what what we do seems like magic uh, to them. And I do nothing to dispel that notion. I am quite all right <laughs> yeah. with them to believe that uh, that this is uh, that this is something truly arcane that we do. In my in my day job, I have to make conversation, um, and often people have had. I remember one particular lady not too long ago, and I said, what, what, what do you do, Beryl? Her name wasn't Beryl. What do you do, Beryl? And she said, all my life I've worked in, uh, I've worked as a, not, it's not a secretary, but, you know, a secretary stroke bookkeeper. But at one stage, um, the, per, the, the gentleman I was working for, he retired, and then I switched over to another company. And that was it. <laughs> and I said, that's very interesting. I always say how interesting. First of all, that's a, how, how interesting. You must have a real passion for X, Y, Z and, and stuff like that. And then we had a, a pretty good conversation about her bookkeeping career. And, uh, and you know, why not? And I'm still talking about now. So that had value, didn't it? Indeed. Indeed. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's a thing that I miss from my journalism days and a good skill that I took away from it is just the ability and the willingness to walk into any situation and have a conversation about anything. And, you know, when you have the willingness to do that and you're open to doing that, you, you find the things and you discover the things that, you know, you, you never imagined you were going to be uh, having a conversation about, it, but you learned the things that, you know, you, d you didn't know you didn't know. You can't go wrong with the weather. That's just a little tip for you. <laughs> how about this heat? How about this cold? How about this rain? How about the lack of rain? <laughs> anyway, David, I'm wasting your time here. Um, reusable, uh, you know, reusable rockets are all the rage, aren't they? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've read that. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's what they say. <laughs> every billionaire's, billionaire's got to have one. Soon every billionaire will have one. It's it's an interesting time. There's a lot of focus now on the um, you know on the, on the billionaire aspect of it, and understandably so. You know, I mean, the headlines are are Bezos and and Richard Branson, and uh, you know that's kind of where the focus is. Is 
this this is a new technology for putting billionaires into space. Um, you know, and I, and I, and being the author of a book on shuttle, you know, we'll, mm. we'll hasten to point out that uh, that while reusability is sort of hitting a uh, a heyday these days, we've we've done it before. You know, I mean, yeah, the space sure. shuttle turns forty years old this year. It was a uh, reusable vehicle, so. Those of us who have been uh, been around and watching it for a little bit, you know, kind of, yeah, we, we, we've seen this before, but um, but yeah, no, I'm 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 really excited about the uh, the flights that we've seen this month, the uh, you know the the new suborbital space tourism, um, the billionaire flights. I I don't know either of the billionaires. I have never met um, J- uh, Richard Branson. I have never met Jeff Bezos, but I knew somebody on on each of those flights. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to host the uh, the Hall of Fame induction for Space Camp. So I am I'm up there, and I'm getting to uh, you know the welcome to the 2021 or the 2019 class of Space Camp Hall of Fame. And one of the people on each of the flights was in that class, um, Beth Moses, who's a Virgin Galactic employee who flew with Richard Branson, um, Wally Funk, of course, the uh, you know the 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 the, the female spaceflight pioneer going back to the, uh, you know, the Mercury 13 tests. They were both sitting uh, at my table for dinner that night, one July, two years ago. And so I'm watching the flights, not because I care anything. <laughs> I mean, you know, I wish them the best, but not because I have a personal interest in, in Branson and Bezos, but I want to see Beth and Wally fly. I'm, I'm super excited about that. And you know, Wally Funk is 82 years old, 82 years old, going to space for the first time. She's flying with an 18 year old, you know, mm. the youngest person, <laughs> oldest person that have ever been to space on the same vehicle together. That's the part that is uh, that is exciting to me. You know, I mean, when I uh, get the opportunity to go and and talk to, uh, you know, talk to teachers at space camp, um, they're going back to their classrooms with people who have seen somebody their age fly into space. I mean, how exciting and, and inspirational is that? So, um, you know, we're not there yet. I, I am not planning on going to space this year. I'm afraid I can't afford the, uh, no, <laughs> the, the somewhere between quarter million to, to $28 million ticket. But, um, but you know, yeah, I, I really hope that my son at some point in his life, yeah, sure, you know, he'll go to space because why not? I mean, we're, we're heading in that direction now. I know you're not a not a not an engineer per se, or are you an engineer in your spare time? I am should... not an engineer in my spare time. I pretend I, I, I pretend to be one sometimes. I love to mention this to people because I I seen a show maybe ten or twenty or thirty years ago because I'm now getting that old, <laughs> and they were doing the space ladder. They were the competition to make the space ladder. So the idea is that you put a satellite up into space and then you create a ladder in between. But apparently you can do it out of, but you can't, you can't obviously do it. I think it would be the first thing that everyone would think of, how to escape the atmosphere, just slowly and not dangerously climb up a ladder. But obviously it's not doable. But have you ever seen any, any talk about, you know, going back to the space ladder plan? <laughs> So the uh, so the, the I don't know if it's the same or similar, but but the, yeah, the space elevator where you oh, sorry the trick space is, elevator. I've yes, made it turned it yes. into a ladder, which is a hell of a uh, like if you want to get some cardio, that's where you go. That's, you don't want to <laughs> climb the hundred mile tall ladder yourself. You want to <laughs> you you want it to take you up. Yeah, uh, that's Let's a workout. Go with the elevator. <laughs> so there are there are, you know there are people who it's it's always just over the horizon you know and there are people i'm sure out there today who are still working it who still think that it's you know just over the horizon it's that uh it, it, you know it is it's that you're talking about mm. you're talking about a wire you're talking about a strand a yeah. single strand of something you know hundreds of miles tall that can that can support this thing um it's it's a materials engineering question more than anything else finding yeah. the the material that's strong enough that's lightweight enough um, that you can, you know, that you can make into a single, single strand um, that long. So I'm, I'm less convinced that uh, that my son is going to get to <laughs> to go up a space elevator in his lifetime. But, uh, but you know, my when people about ask me about any of this, you know, are we going to see this in in my lifetime? Are we going to, you know, are we going to get to do this? I've got a book on my shelf that I keep. From uh, from 1957, 1958, titled "Your Trip 
to mm. outer space. Oh, so right. this is written in the late fifties. Nobody, no human being has been into space yet. Um, I think this was around the time that the first satellites were launched. But so this writer is writing a book about your trip to outer space, saying that someday, like, like really human beings will go to outer space. Yeah. In fact, in your lifetime, people may go to the moon, possibly by the year 2000. And then this to him is, he's writing this book and that's an ambitious goal. Like maybe yeah. in your lifetime, maybe by 2000, you're gonna see people going to the moon. And, and it's 12 years away, it's around the corner. I mean, people yeah. are about to be making the first space flights, but for this guy sitting in the late 50s, like maybe, maybe by 2000, he can't, and this is somebody knowledgeable enough about it to yeah. write an entire book. I mean, this is not, you know, Joe Schmo walking down the street. Yeah. Well, I think people will be on the moon by 2000. This is somebody knowledgeable enough to write a book about it. And yet he has no clue that 12 years from then, 11 years from then, people are going to be walking on the moon. So, you know, I really hope when we have these conversations, I really hope, you know, somebody's going to be saying, you know, can you believe that in, in 2021, David Hinton was talking to Dan Pritchard and they were talking about space elevators and he thought it might not even be in his son's lifetime. And, you know, and here we are five years later, people are going on the space elevator. I, I, I you know, I really hope that I'm the guy that, uh, that in the future, somebody says, man, that David Hinton guy, he was smart enough to write books and yet he had no clue how fast all of this was going to happen. So I, I hold on to that. I guess it's some technique. I guess it's a breakthrough that speeds things up, isn't it? Um, it's, so it was is. there a, was there a breakthrough in and around like the uh, the space shuttle program, or was it like a was it like a gentle creep, or was it like oh my goodness, if we put this with this, then we're winners. Um, a little of both, you know. Yeah. I mean, the the reality is, frequently more than more than the technological breakthroughs, it's the the political breakthroughs, or the uh. the business breakthroughs, or the uh, the motivation breakthroughs. You know, I mean the the uh, going to the moon. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that had to be invented to put human beings on the moon the first time. But the biggest thing that had to happen to put people on the moon for the first time is you had to, you know, you had to have this race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. I mean, without that, you could have the technology all day long, but you're not going to have the will and you're not going to have the money. Like we talked about the, uh, you know, the space shuttle was reusable 40 years ago. Why is reusability, you know, the new hotness in 40 years after the space shuttle started flying? Um, you know, it's not necessarily because, oh, we have a new technology of reusability. I mean, there are, there are advancements. There's definitely areas where, uh, where improvements have been made. Um, but now there's a business case, right? You know, now industry is seeing, you're having companies like SpaceX and like Blue Origin and like Rocket Lab saying, okay, now we see the business case for that. And that's why all of a sudden you have this explosion. Um, so the shuttle was, was the same way. And the shuttle, oh gosh, you know, the... <laughs> The space shuttle was insane. The space shuttle arguably never should have existed. Um, nobody since then has ever really undertaken anything quite that ambitious. Nobody today is working on anything quite that ambitious. I don't think I will live to see another vehicle as ambitious as the space shuttle, you know, inner development again. Um, but it's being done at the time that, uh, that people are walking on the moon. And so, you know, you... <laughs> You you have the conversation. Is this too hard? Is this too ambitious? Is this too insane? And uh, you know, and, and and there was literally somebody on the moon when they announced it. You know, like Congress has has told NASA they can proceed if they want to to build this space shuttle. Uh, should we do it? You know, John Young looks down at his feet. His feet are standing on the freaking moon. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel good about it. Like when you're on the moon. <laughs> Anything seems possible. So that was kind of the, uh, you know, that to, to me, as much as anything, the revolution that made the space shuttle possible was less any of the individual technologies as just that moment in, in the national history and the, the national mindset of we can do anything. Sure, let's do it because why not? We can do anything. You know, the shuttle was, it, it's it you know it, it, it's a rocket it takes off like a rocket but there's an airplane on it so you know it takes off like a rocket and it comes in like an airplane but in addition to being a rocket and an airplane like it's literally 
any vehicle that you see, you go out today and you drive around the city and you look in any vehicle that you see, oh, you're, okay, you're in your car. It's your, your mode of transportation. What's take, it's what takes you to work. Sure, that's the space shuttle. It's the thing that takes the astronauts to work. Um, you know, you pass a, a construction truck. You know, oh, well, that's the space shuttle. The space shuttle can help you build things. You know, it's, a, it, it's the construction truck for you. And it's, it's a you lab. the recycling truck. Um, yeah, sure. You know, it can recycle your satellites. It'll go up. It'll get the satellites. It'll bring them back. You can recycle them. It's a, mm. Oh, it's an RV. You can put something in it like it's a work put truck. The, you can have a laboratory. Lab um, on it, and they put the, put the arm. And that was the arm always on there, or did they add that on Meccano style? Do you know what Meccano? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> oh, it's just like advanced Lego where you can make a little machine. But anyway, forget about Meccano. It's boring. <laughs> so they, did they put? Did they always have the arm for the space shuttle? Do you know? Okay, so now you're going to embarrass me. I'm, no, I am no, 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 not at all. Ninety percent sure that uh, that for some of the missions when they had a uh, you know when they were because car- they would carry a laboratory inside the space shuttle. So before mm. we had the space station. You would fly, you know, a full up laboratory inside the, uh, the, the, the space shuttle. I believe um, for some of the payloads, they, they had the arm out. But, um, you know, now we're going to get calls from, uh, from, the real, from the real space geeks that, uh, that will say, you know, I can't believe David well, said that on a... can easily delete those emails. <laughs> and how long would a, would a space shuttle spend out in, in space typically? Um, typically a week or two, um, okay. depending on the mission. And it was fairly um, comfortable because it looks big. It so you know so it's all about your uh, it's all about your perspective. Hmm. Um, it was you know it, the, the the one that I go to is uh, you know on on the first space lab mission the, the first one where they carried the laboratory inside the shuttle. Hmm. Um, two of the astronauts on that mission, John Young, um, had flown before going to the moon. He'd flown the Apollo missions. Um, so he, his past experience is, uh, is coming out of, uh, coming out of, you know, the little Apollo cap, I say little, I mean, you know, the decent size Apollo capsules that they used to go to the moon. Um, also on the mission with him, um, my homesteading space co-author, my friend, Owen Garriott, who had flown previously on Skylab. And so, you know, these, uh, these two guys have both flown to space before for, uh, for John Young. Oh man, this space shuttle, man, this is huge, um, for Owen Garriott coming out of Skylab. You know, I mean, it's, mm. it's not, it's, mm. but it's not, it's not huge. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's not for people that are big on privacy. If you, uh, if you feel the need for a lot of per- personal space, um, probably not going to want to fly on uh, on shuttle. Cause there's essentially, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's two rooms and there's uh seven of you on there. So you're not going to get any time to yourself. Um, you know, you're sleeping in a sleeping bag attached to the wall um, yeah. so that you're not actively bumping into people during the night. You couldn't um, put in a po- podcast, couldn't pop in a podcast back then. So, very noisy mm-hmm. also. So, yeah, you'd have to have good good noise counts. Uh, counts what was it noisy? Um, Who was noisy? Was this a person it's, problem it's, or an equipment problem? It's, <laughs> it's a machine. You know, I mean, at the oh, end right. of the day, it's it's a machine. It's the most complicated piece of machinery that uh, that humans had built at that time. So it's got all the uh, all the little all the little valves and and blowers and beepers and and everything that are th- always going. So I thought uh, like they might have uh, there might be you know a series of astro- heavy metal astronauts that you know like to play their <laughs> play their music but not on headphones. But no, no. <laughs> So could have been some of that too. Again, de- depends on the mission. Depends on who you're flying with. And what did Skylab achieve? I know you know. So the biggest thing that Skylab achieved is, um, you know, Skylab comes after the uh, the Apollo moon landings, and so everything that had been done in in space at that time was about going somewhere, right? Um, you know, the, the analogy that I like to use is, uh, you know, I'll go to the airport. Um, there's everybody that's there. They're, they're waiting to get on airplanes. You go up to somebody, hey, where are you going? And nobody ever answers the sky, right? <laughs> uh, it's, it's technically true. You know, we're all there to get on these big metal birds, and the big metal birds are going to take us up into the sky. Um, you know, at some point, it's going to, you know, put us down somewhere else. And that's the answer that we give. We never say, the sky, even though it's true. And that's kind of where we were with space. We're going through space, much like an airplane is going through the sky, but, uh, but the where, the where are you going is, um, is the moon, right? I mean, even from the earliest missions that aren't going to the moon yet, but they're paving the way, 
That's the goal. We're on Mercury, on on Gemini. Um, you know, I mean, with the for the for the Soviet program, with uh, with Voskhod, with Vostok, um, we're going to the moon. We're we're going, you know, into Earth orbit to get there. Um, Skylab is the first time that, that the sky is the answer. I mean, it, it's <laughs> appropriately enough since it is Skylab. Um, it is the laboratory in the sky. We're not going to the place. We are going there. Because it turns out that there are things that we can do in the sky that, uh, that we can't do here on Earth that we couldn't do on the moon. It's the first time that we're really learning to, uh, to live and work, to, uh, to find out what happens to the, to the human body um, in that environment, to do materials research, to, uh, to find out. I mean, you know, so many of the basic rules of physics work differently in, in, in microgravity and orbit. Um, you know, flames burn differently. If you've never watched a video of, of what a candle looks like in, in space, I mean, it looks, a, a, a candle, something that simple, looks completely different in space than it does on Earth. Fire forms little balls that, uh, that float around. And so this was the first time that we really, you know, let's, what can we do here? Can, can, we, can we live here, right? You know, I mean, can we get stuff done? Um, and then are there things worth doing? Um, to do there, and so everything that's happened in uh, in human spaceflight since then, um, you know, and, and again, to be fair, the uh, you know the Soviets were kind of dabbling with this uh, the same thing on their side at the same time, um, but you know, flying NASA flying the uh, the space shuttle does not happen without Skylab proving that uh, that yeah, going into Earth orbit, going into this uh, this this zero g environment is worth doing. The International Space Station is built on that foundation um, to some extent. Hubble, because um, Skylab had a, uh, a telescope attached to the space station, and so it's a uh, you know a precursor for uh, for space astronomy. Um, so really, everything that's happened in the you know now forty eight years since then is kind of built on on that foundation of proving that uh, that this is a thing that we can do, and it is a thing that is very worth doing. I should say so. It was amazing. It was in the news a lot at the time. And uh, I think it captured the whole world's imagination, the Skylab, and certainly um, gave the Soviet Soviets a you know pause for thought. Uh, but they they didn't do their own space shuttle though, did they? They just let you guys get on with it. Um, you know, they flew. They they built a space shuttle. They flew it one time. Um, they actually finished their their space shuttle program. They had. Um, I th- uh, multiple units either finished or, or just about finished, um, flew at one time. And that was around the time that the, uh, the Soviet union broke up. Uh-huh. And, and after that, there was just no will to, uh, to fly it anymore. So they had a, they had a shuttle for, for one mission and, uh, and they were done. Do you know what Russia's priority is for space or are they just letting other people get, get on with it? Or have, are you hearing much out of the former Soviet socialist Republic? So you know, so Russia is 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 still very much involved in the uh, the International Space Station today, July 29th, as we talk. A new Russian module was added to the space station today. They uh, the, for the first time in years added a new segment to the uh, to the space station. Wow! Um, they are they are actively working now also with uh, with China. So so Russia kind of is an interesting place where they have you know partnerships on the one hand with uh, with the United States and Europe through the International Space Station program. They're also now talking with uh, with China about um, you know of course the, the the United States now is working to go back to the moon and and hopefully you know just a few years. Um, Russia and China are saying, well, you know, we want to go to the moon, but we don't want to go with you. So we're going to start our own moon base. And, uh, and anybody that wants to join us can, uh, can come and be part of our moon base. And so we're, we're, we're kind of starting to see shades of, uh, of where we were, you know, 50, 60 years ago with, uh, with these competing programs again to, uh, to get back to the moon. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. At least go back to the moon just to clean up a lot of the stuff that's hanging out there. It's a bit of a tidy. <laughs> so, well, so the, the rule is you can't touch anything that's already there. There's now, you know, historic preservation sites on really? the, uh, on the moon. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta leave it be. So hard to, hard to police. Uh, <laughs> another thing I'm sure you were excited about was um, uh, new horizons. And uh, the trip to Pluto and behind 
beyond. And I, I remember lying on the lounge and, and waiting for the for the for the near pass, probably not the cry, and being very excited, and then of course dozing off for the actual main bit. And <laughs> because you know, but uh, what did you think about that at the time? It must have been exciting. Oh, so yes, yeah. I mean, the the the, the lost world, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we we had good images. We had seen, you know, uh, and and poor old New Horizons that it, uh, it launched launched to go to a planet and it arrives at a uh, at a former planet. I mean, all of that happened during the uh, during the transit to Pluto. But um, but you know, I mean, yeah, when when New Horizons launched, Pluto is the the planet that we we just kind of don't know anything about and. Uh, to see those images and you know so that's that's what that thing is you know and it turns out to be looks like um, i remember this warning with the morning it's like it could be boring it could be boring, could be boring. and then it was bit as we got a little bit closer it was the least boring thing <laughs> you know the science this is where the scientists and uh, I mean, they didn't get it wrong you know they just downplayed it just in case it was a bit boring yeah it's a fantastic images and um then we went out further to the space peanut and it was fairly interesting <laughs> so uh so a thing that's happening you know again right now as we speak the um the planetary science decadal survey steering committee is uh is meeting which sounds like a uh you know a, a wonderful bit of bureaucracy um but the way this works is so every every 10 years um, they put together a, a plan of more accurately a list of priorities for, uh, for what do we want to do next in, in planetary science? Where do we want to go? What do we want to explore? And so, you know, the big missions that you see, um, things like, you know, Cassini, like New Horizons, like, uh, and I say that New Horizons may have actually been out of the, um, a different program, um, but these are, you know, some, somebody is establishing these, these priorities. This is, this is what we want to do. Um, we're getting closer to the launch of the, uh, the Europa Clipper mission that's going to go to, uh, to Jupiter's moon Europa. And that's one that came out of the, uh, the last planetary science decadal survey. So, you know, we're currently in the, 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 the period of the 2020s. They're meeting now for, uh, for what are the priorities for the, for the 2030s? Because if you're going to fly a mission in the 2030s, you need to be working on it, you know, like now to, to start all the preparations that it's going to take to get you there to fly in the next decade. So, uh, so they're having the conversations now about, you know, what are the priorities for the, for the 2030s? And um, now, you know, like now there are fun toys that we didn't have, mm -hmm. even when they were planning the, uh, you know, the 2020s with, uh, with NASA's space launch system coming online. Um, you know, some of the work that, uh, you know, that SpaceX is doing with the, uh, with the Falcon Heavy, potentially with, uh, potentially with Starship. This is now enabling missions that you know ten years ago were uh, were impossible, and so there's a you know there's there is a team that is proposing okay like flying by Pluto you know like that was pretty neat I mean it was good getting those pictures you know it was nice doing the flyby but uh, but you know if we really want to understand Pluto we uh, we need to either be in orbit or we need to be on the surface and so that was impossible when they designed New Horizons that's impossible you literally cannot do that. Um, that's changed. Now that's possible. Um, is that a priority? You know, hey, we just went to Pluto. Should we be going to uh, to Uranus or Neptune, for example, next? You know, we we Voyagers forty years ago flew by uh, by Uranus and Neptune, but that's all we've done there is just that quick flyby. Um, do we need to go in orbit one of the, the the gas or the ice giants rather? And that's you know a thing that not that long ago you can't do. Um, but now it's on the table. Like now, that's now a thing that you could do. So that's one of the possibilities. There's a team pushing a, uh, you know, a, a Neptune mission, um, Enceladus, uh, the moon of, uh, of, of, of Saturn that has geysers that are spewing mm -hmm. material from, you know, a subsurface ocean out into space. Well, okay. If there's on earth where there's, where there's water, there's life. I mean, like literally on the planet earth, if we find water, we find life. Um, is that true in our solar system? And so you have these, these worlds like Europa, like Enceladus that have these, uh, you know, these oceans underneath the surface. Um, well, you know, A, we haven't been even to the surface of any of these, but even if you were to land something, well, the oceans 
down there? You know, how do you access it? How do you uh, how do you how do you find out what's down in the ocean? And so Enceladus is 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 kindly is very very uh, very generously spewing its ocean out into space. So instead of having to go down below the surface. Um, you fly by it, you go through one of these, uh, these geysers, you pick up some of the material and you now have, you know, samples of what's down there. And so that's one of the teams. Um, there's a team that's saying, let's, you know, let's go to Europa again and let's this time go down to the surface and let's actually land on Europa and let's, uh, Europa does something similar. It, it, we now have discovered it has geysers as well, but it also has big cracks in the surface where some of this material is, is, you know, is being conveyed from the, the subsurface ocean coming up through these cracks and depositing on the surface. Um, so if we could get near the cracks and we could see, you know, okay, this is, this is what's down there in that ocean. So that's one of the proposals. And so, you know, this, uh, this, this delightful bit of space, space science bureaucracy that's happening right now, um, you know, I am, I am so eager to see what are the priorities that are going to come out of that. And, uh, you know, and where are we going to be going 10 years from now to, uh, to explore and, and get those same sort of, uh, those hmm. same sort of revelations that we got in New Horizons. You know, aliens, aliens don't need to be uh, human size or twice human size or as big as Cloverfield or as anything like that. They could be like tiny little, and you could look in the microscope and they could be just like sea monkeys going, hey, hey. well, they'd be probably pretty angry if they have <laughs> anger. <laughs> hey. <laughs> well, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? And so, um, yeah. Far yeah. less scary than uh, alien aliens <laughs> yeah. three through seven or whatever. How many uh, aliens they're up to? <laughs> there's anything we've learned in the past year and a half, though. It's those those tiny things can be scary too, right? You know, those, oh, those yeah. little bitty life forms can uh, can really shake up your world a little bit. <sighs> Don't worry about that, David. It's all going to. <laughs> let's hope we learn something out of it. Amen. 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 Yes. Well, look, we spent a lot of time. To, We've we'll spent a lot of David Hitt's time today and we should let him go and get on with his day, but we should find things that we can buy from him. That's the most important thing. Homesteading Space, the Skylab story. That's great. And uh, Bold Day Rise. They were bold, weren't they? The Space Shuttle Early Years. What else can we buy from you, David, or is that the two main items? Those are the those are the two main items. Um, you can follow me um, at David Hit uh, D A V I D H I T T on Twitter. Um, so if I think of anything else that you uh, that I want to sell you, I'll, I'll let you know there. But uh, but, uh, but yeah, the the books are the big ones, and uh, you know you can find them online anywhere that that uh, the books are sold, and they now have them on audiobooks. Like how exciting is that? I'm now an audiobook author, um, and uh, and you can go. Did you and, do it, you know, or did you do, let someone else do it for you? I, I, I did not do it. They, they didn't ask me if I wanted to do it. They, uh, they told me after it was done, Rude. that's that, uh, that it had been taken care of. So they, uh, yeah, they, they, they have the professionals for that. Yeah. That'd be an interesting job, wouldn't it? I mean, I wouldn't fancy it, but, um, I don't know. Look, there's lots of different jobs since the internet and the internet spawned a whole, you know, it, it Very it's true. It's a brand new frontier itself, isn't it? It is. It is indeed. Yeah. And I it, love it, it when guests the, uh... just um, agree with my stupid stuff. It's fantastic. <laughs> this internet, like <laughs> I think there may be something there. You know, you, you may be onto something. No, it's uh, it it definitely changes the way we uh, we interact with information. It's, Absolutely, it's an and we can uh, we can talk to David Hit. He's all the way on the other side of the planet, <laughs> and um, doing a fantastic job there communicating all about space thank you so much david oh thank for you your for time. having me it's it's been a pleasure i'd, I'd love talking to you